Okay, uh, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, fellow alcoholics. How are we? Right, first of all, I've got to say to you is this. I bow to you because you have left an alcoholic beverage over there. This is where it's all going to happen. And when you leave here tonight, you're going to know something about Scotch whiskey. Because over there, what's over there? The pussies. <laughs> Meow. What are they? Pussies. What are they? Pussies. Absolutely. Because what is so important, I want you to leave San Francisco and come back to Scotland with me. I want to see that you really sense and imbibe the spirit. You take it into your body, you take it into your heart. Both my father and my grandfather were whiskey blenders. That's why whiskey runs in my blood. But what annoys me so much, and I've already seen it today, is the way that people look at whiskey. Hello, hello, knock it back like cowboys. So be aware. How many of you have been with me before? Anybody been with me before? One or two of you. Well done. Thank you for coming back. Okay. It's very important. Those that have not been before is you go away and you tell them. Not only do you tell them, you slap them in their faces. I'm being serious because you'll see so much abuse tonight. So let's begin. In the beginning, the Scots called it Ishkobea, meaning the water of life, because it's water more than anything that gave whiskey its backbone and its character. So they took that name, whiskey, and they anglicized it. Ushkabeya iski iski whiskey. That's how the name came about. Probably unknown to the Greeks or the Romans because there's no mention whatsoever in their poems or their plays. Generally speaking, whiskey distillation is attributed to the time of King Henry II because when he was over in Ireland oppressing the Irish, he came across actual distilleries in operation. And because Scotland is only 16 miles of a difference between Scotland and Ireland, Many people think it was the Irish that brought it into Scotland, and of course it was the Scots that perfected it. The Irish bringing it into Scotland? What a total load of bollocks. That is not the case. After all, who got to America before Christopher Columbus? Of course, the Scandinavians, they got there before Christopher Columbus on Friday, the 12th of October, 1492, at six minutes past six in the morning. But irrespective of being the Scandinavians or the Irish, it doesn't matter who motivated, who stimulated them. A group of, another group of alcoholics known as Christian missionary monks. These were the people, you've come across them. Yes, Christian missionary monks. So what pushed them, what motivated them? You have to go over to China. In China in 1333, there was volcanic eruptions, there was floods, there was pestilence. And from there, we get the Black Death. The Black Death scourges right across Europe between 1347 to 1351, killing no less than 75, 75 million people. So the poor people and firm people had to get their medicine, had to see their doctors, had to go to the hospitals. But they didn't exist. Only the Cistercian monks, the Benedictine monks, the Grey Friars, the Black Friars, only these people could come up with some form of medicine. So within the confines of many of the monasteries, they already had the alembic stills operating. And the white spirit came off. The white spirit as you see it today, it came off and they put it into a vessel and they mixed it and they took the herbs and spices and they said, take this, this is a cure against the black death. So they drank it eagerly. And as soon as the alcohol went down into their stomachs, it gave them life. It gave them life. That's why we call it aqua vitae eau de vie ushkabea, meaning the water of life. But instead of these religious orders staying to look after their people, what did they do? They hid them. And they went from one country to another, leaving them behind, tasting and giving people the taste of alcohol. So cracks in religion began to appear. The poor people said, why is God deserting us? This is not right. That's why we take the power of the church and put it into the universities. So these cracks get bigger. Because when Henry VIII hits the throne, Saturday, 10.30, 21st of April, 1509, 
when his Henry the Seventh dies after the Battle of Bosworth Field, 22nd of August, 1485, getting the Tudor dynasty together. So when his father dies, Henry VIII says, I'm now head of the Tudor dynasty. I'm looking for a son to carry on, but I'm looking for my Tudor dynasty to carry on as well. So what does he do? If you've been watching the Tudors, he marries Catherine of Aragon. He brings Catherine of Aragon from Spain with England to fight against France. Gets her pregnant, she loses the baby. Little Harry comes along, 59 days, that's the end of him. Then on Friday the 18th of February, 1516, Mary's born. What's going on here, Catherine? I'm looking for a son, not a daughter. Be patient, Henry, everything will be all right. After 20 years of marriage, nothing is right. There's no sun in the horizon. The only thing that's on the horizon is the beauty, beautiful, sensual, sexual, oh, lumptious, sexy Anne Boleyn. And as soon as Henry VIII sees Anne Boleyn, boom, he gets absolutely infatuated with her falls, her, falls in love with her, gets her pregnant in January 1533, quickly marries her on the 25th of January 1533, then weighing in at seven pound two ounces on the 7th of September 1533, Elizabeth the Frost of England's born. He's now got two daughters, he's got now two sons, better get a divorce. So he picks up the phone and he speaks to Pope Clement VII and says, Pope, can you give me a divorce? On your, well you can't say on your bike because you don't understand it, he says, get lost. I have nothing to do with you. And Henry VIII says, wait a minute, who do you think you're talking to? This is Henry VIII. So he breaks from away from Rome. And you're all wondering, where the hell is this story going? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> where it's going is this, is that Henry VIII runs out of money. He needs money. Where is the money? It's in the church. So between 1536 to 1541, King Henry VIII breaks down 823 monasteries. He makes 10,600 monks redundant. And where are these monasteries? In England. Have you been to England? What a shower of bastards they are. So never forget that. So 823 monasteries, 10,600 monks redundant. But these are the people that know the art of winemaking, whiskey distillation, and they leave the respective monasteries from England and they come to Scotland and they bring the art of distillation with them. So they set up their distilleries. They make money from it. They make money from it. What happens when you guys make money? The government comes along and takes most of it away from you. So this is what they did. Let's tax these hairy bums up in Scotland. It started on 1644 onwards. To cut a long story short, by 1823, nobody paid attention to paying any taxation. By 1823, there was some in the region of 14,600 illicit distilleries operating in Scotland. And they said, come on guys, this has got to stop. This illicit distilling, people are getting drunk, it's going into the armies and the navies. We've got to control it. Let's get together. What's your problems? What's your grievances? Well, you're taxing us too harshly. Spain is bringing in the wines and France is bringing in the brandies. It's not economical for us to produce Scotch whiskey. So they got together with the distillers and said for the first time, like Paul, Paul, yes, Paul, Paul, like this great guy here. He says, I'm going to start distilling legally for the first time and Paul would take out a license. It cost him about $20. The size of his still is going to be 40 gallons and it's going to be charged at two and four pence a farthing per proof gallons, but it's going to be a small pot still. And one by one, the distilleries took out the licenses and became legitimate distillers. So please, when you leave here today and you see a pot still, not this shape, much bigger, 20, 30 feet high, think of single malt whiskey. Think of cognac, think of rum. Liked by most people, but not by the ladies. They wanted something lighter. So the patent still, the twin column affair was brought in and they produced green whiskey. Never forget, green whiskey is like a beautiful woman. What do they do? They seduce the males. That's what my green whiskey does. It seduces the malts in the blends. So when you think of the patent still, think of green whiskey. Think of light rum. Think of gin. But more importantly, think of vodka. Something that's got not too much taste in the comparison to the single malt whiskey. So this is where our story begins. Where are we gone? We've got next, can we have the slide, the first slide? There we are. This is the illicit distiller. 
painted by Sir Edward Landseer in 1826. Sir Edward Landseer says, probably nothing to you people. He was born in 1802, died in 1873. Have you ever come to London? If you ever come to London, you'll see Trafalgar Square. See Trafalgar Square, Nelson's column. You'll see four giant lions designed by the same man here. This tells you so much. Look at this painting. One in five people are poverty stricken. And here is the distiller sampling his first whiskey for the very first time. And this is what I want to show you for the very first time. This is not whiskey. It's called the new spirit. It cannot be called whiskey until it has been in the cask for three years. So what we do is we put it into the glass. And what he did, he put it into the glass. He looked at it. He took mint, sugar, thyme, puts it in, mixes it together and drinks it. And it goes down in his throat. And what happens? Half an hour later, he's dead. <laughs> Why is he dead? Because he had only distilled it once, not twice. By distilling it twice, he purified it. That's why when you go over to Ireland, they have to distill it three times to get it right. But we won't go into that. <laughs> so, so this is the whiskey here. This is a new spirit. So this is the very beginning. Have a look at the glass. It's a Copita nosing glass. So if I ever see you holding a glass like this, if I ever see you warming it like this, but worse still, if I see you going like this, I'll kill you. You need to bring it up and say hello, and you need to get to know it. It's like this lovely lady here, Suzanne. I've never met her before, but she looks a charming, elegant, beautiful woman. And how do I get to know her? Is this your husband? Fuck off. Right, okay. So, 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 sorry, Paul. Right. So, so, so I come up to Suzanne, I talk to her. The more I talk to Suzanne, the more her character comes out. And that's what I'm looking for the whiskey. But you'll not see it going like this. You need to explore it. You need to get into it. And that's what's so important. So, let's get into it. And this is the beginning of single malt whiskey. This is one in five people are poverty stricken. That's why malt whiskey gets underway. And I've told you about grain whiskey. Comes into the marketplace officially on the 9th of September, 9th of September, 1832. So we've got grain whiskey, we've got malt whiskey. This is the first reference, yes. This is the first reference to Scotch whiskey. Eight balls of malt to make aqua vitae. There's the word for Friar John Carr. Okay, yes, here we go. Here's the next still. That's the still of 1494, which you replicated in 1994. It gives you an idea of what the pot looks like. So we've got grain whiskey, we've got malt whiskey. Why don't we mix the two together? And the man that does it, is this great man here, Andrew Usher, U-S-H-E-R. He's the man that pioneers the art of whiskey blending. When you think of Usher, I want you to think of Dom Perignon. Dom Perignon was much earlier. He's the man that did the different cuvées of champagne together. Born 1638, died 1715. Whereas this man was born 1826, baptized on the 16th of February, 1826 died of bowel cancer on the 1st of November, 1898. But what you've got to remember is the year, 1860. 1860, when he takes his malt whiskies, grain whiskies, puts them together and forms the blended whisky. So popular was it that he made a fortune from it, somewhere in the region of 38 million pounds when he devoted and giving uh, the, the lovely musical hall to Edinburgh uh, way back in 1912. He's the man that set the precedence and made it happen. Amongst these energetic blenders were our own founders, James White, Charles Mackay, who got to, together in 1844. They produced many different styles. Like the company, they needed many different people. Customs and excise, making sure everything's under control. The Cooper, to make sure the casts are solid. And these, of course, are the art office tarts. So we make sure <laughs> that everything's all right. So this is the bottles. When you come to San Francisco, Chicago, New York, these are the bottles you see of the 18th century. Dark green, black glass. It suited the period perfectly. There was no glasses. Everybody drank from the bottle. 
And because it was black glass, nobody could see into the bottles. Nobody could see what they were drinking. That's why when they drank, they never knew if they were going to wake up the next day. Then Mr. Ricketts came along. 5th of December, 1821. What did Mr. Ricketts do? He, of course, gave the three-part mold, hand-finished bottle. But for the first time in creation, you could see into the bottle. That's why all our whiskies today, even if you go over there to the other ship and see the whiskies, the majority are clear glass. Because the consumer today says, I want to see exactly what I'm drinking. Okay, so we started blending and bottling in Glasgow. Glasgow and Edinburgh, they were the whiskey capitals. Down in England, they said, no, no, we don't want anything to do with you Scots. We prefer the brandy and the cognac. That's our main drink. We want nothing to do with you whiskey people and running around in your skirts. Because we can still remember the Battle of Culloden, the last battle to be fought when you crossed the border in 1745 and we chased you back up to Inverness, to the Culloden Moor, where the two armies met, Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Duke of Cumberland, on Wednesday, the 16th of April, 1746, between one o'clock, two o'clock. Yes, and you guessed it, it was raining. And when we annihilated it, they said, we want nothing to do with you, Scots. We prefer our brandy. So what led to the final breakthrough? It happened when a group of bodies were over in America collecting vine samples. They brought the vine samples into England. Little did they know that embedded in the vine shoots was this little beetle here. This is the Phylloxera vasterix beetle discovered in Hammersmith, London in 1863, eating the roots of the vine. It got up, spread right across Europe, devastating every single vineyard. By 1872, it had hit the cognac area. So it was no longer possible to send the same volumes of cognac and brandy into England and to Scotland. So, thanks to this beetle, Scotch whiskey got underway. And of course, it came from California. And as you look, go up to the Sonoma Napa Valley, I think it's about 20,000 acres are still currently affected. The only way to combat the disease is to take the American rootstock and graft it onto the European stock. We could talk about this all night, but please bear in mind, uh, you guys up in California from my book, this is the one I used, you guys charged me $280 for this photograph, but the actual size of the beetle is the size of a pinhead. But if one female's eggs managed to survive, it would be the equivalent of five tons of eggs. So it's a randy little beetle. And don't think for one minute that it's still out of existence. It's still very much there. Hit Australia, New Zealand, December 2007, 2006. So it's very much part of our lives today, but we at least know more about it. Anyway, moving quickly on. You come to Scotland now. This is what I want you to see. This is what I want you to really feel. Because when you come to Scotland, you need to see the four different regions. The lowlands, light and body, charm, elegance, but more importantly, femininity. Go to the highlands, rugged countryside, snow-capped and mountains. These are whiskies that need longer to mature. Then we go down to Campbellton on the west coast, facing America, more bringing in the sea. And therefore, these whiskies are salty, not dry salt, but damp salt. And then finally, over to the Islas, medicinal, smoky, peppery. But you get softer ones like Brooklady and Bunnahabbin. So these are the four distinctive areas. So when you come to the distillery for the first time, don't just look at the distillery. Use your eyes. Sense the place. Look at the distillery. How do I know it's a distillery, Richard? It tells you. It's a mighty Chinese pagoda head. It's like a church. It's shining at you. Because it's taken, looks like a pyramid. Yes, it is. Because it's taken from the pyramids of Giza. Introduced by Charles Cree Doig. He did 120 of them. 56 of them are still in use today. So you have the pagoda head. Underneath you have the barley. And below that you have the peat. The set on fire and the pagoda head sucks the air up through the barley and impregnates it with that smokiness. And then what about this character? Well, I don't know anything about the character. Yes, you do, because you've got this lovely hillside. He tells you it's got full of body, character with lovely floral notes. And then you go to Jura. There's Jura. How many of you, anybody into Jura? No? 
You must come. It's an island on its own, opposite Isla. Opposite Isla. It's only 28 miles long to 1 to 8 miles wide. 189 people live on the island. 111 have got telephones. Swappy parties every 30 night. But they've only got, they've only got one hotel built 1742, one distillery established 1810, one shop, one priest, one minister, one doctor. It's a small, small community, and therefore Jura single malt is very much part of that individuality. But then the one we want to concentrate on tonight is Dalmore. Dalmore was established in 1839. The name Dalmore means big meadowland because there's lots of meadows, lots of barley fields here. And then there's a mighty Ben with us. So it's beyond Inverness. And I'll show you exactly where it is soon. But look at it. It tells you immediately, is this whiskey going to be light, fragrant? No, it's going to have muscle, body, structure. And you can see that from the mighty Ben with us. So let's look at the first whiskey tonight, and that is the Dalmore 12 years old on your map. You've got that in, your, in front of you? The 12 years old? Right. So this is what we do. This is the 12 years old. Before you sample it, before you sample it, make sure the glass is always clean. Swirl it around. This is what I do in my sample room in Glasgow. Swing it and fling it on the floor. It's the most expensive carpet in Britain, but never mind. When you go back to it, I want you to make sure, as I said to you before, don't let me see you holding a glass like this. Don't let me see you warming it. I want you to make sure you hold it right at the bottom. Swirl it around, bring it up and say, hello. Then you go back to say, how are you? And then you go back to say, quite well, Thank you very much. But I want you to make sure you go like this. Go like this. Go like this. None of this pussy stuff. Hello. Hello. Just get into it. Okay? So when you move it around your nostril, when you move it around and find the exact place, hello, how are you? The alcohol is going to hit you first. Then you investigate into it. Like a woman's perfume. When you talk about a woman's perfume, well, when you think about Chanel number no. five, I mean, Chanel number no. five is the, still the most, you know, wonderful perfume uh, way back, you know, put together by Ernest Bow in 1921. 1921, she was given 10 samples. Coco Chanel, she was given 10 samples and she chose number no. five. As you all know, she was born on the 19th of August, 1883, same as the Brooklyn Bridge. And of course, she died on Sunday, the 10th of January, 1971. And of course, she put it together. That's why you, when she was born on the 19th of August, you get Coco number 19 or Chanel number 19. But the top note is jasmine and Bulgarian roses. So when you know this, what do you think the top note might be? You've got 26 different uses. What do you think the top, any ideas? Yes, you've got caramel. What else have you got? Citrus. You've got lovely citrus fruits. You've got lovely marmalade. You've got spice. You've got crushed almonds. You've got coffee. You've got vanilla. But it's a marmalade. The citrus notes that are on the top. And then what you want to do is to make sure you take perhaps a little water. You must make sure the water is all right. So when you go to any restaurant in the world, you pick up the jug by the handle. No, you don't. Don't trust the handle. No matter where you are in the world, please do not do that. You do it this way. You put it in your hand and you go like that and you test the water. Why are you doing that, Richard? Because I've burnt myself 20 times now. Because many barmen put it under a hot tap by mistake. You must make sure and check the water. Then what you do is you take that lovely water, still water, and you reduce it down to about 35, 38% alcohol. But don't do what the vast majority of people, especially in California do. Give me a guy, give me a Dalmore. What's this Dalmore, 12 years old? Oh, that's what I'm looking for. Thanks very much. Oh, that was great. Thanks very much. I'll kill you. 
you must give it respect. It's going to be a heavy night, but this is. But what you want to do is go back to it. You want to go back to it, and I want you to take a little water this time. Just take it. But this is what I want you to do more than anything. I don't want you to knock it by like a cowboy. I want you to take a big mouthful. Let's do it together. When I go like that, that's the top of the tongue. When I go like that, it's underneath the tongue, and then back. Can we do that together? But I want to hear you. Mm, mm, mm. You ready? One, two, three, here we go. Mm, mm, mm. Hello there. This is what it's all about. Look at the way you've extracted the flavors. Like Suzanne, when she prepares a dish for all her lovers, they don't just gobble it down. They don't just gobble it down. They take the food and they hold it long, long, long in the mouth. The longer they keep the food in the mouth, the more they extract the flavors. It's the same with the whiskey. Look at the difference. Very soft, very elegant. Can you see that just now? Let's go on to not the second whiskey. I want you to go on to the, the third whiskey, the 15 years old. Go to the 15 years old. <coughs> go to the 15 years old. That's the third whiskey. Because I want to show you the difference between the 12 and the 15. This, of course, is different. Now, the 12 years old is 50% American white oak, 50% American white oak to 50% sherry. And we're gonna to come to these casts very shortly. 50% sherry. This one you're now sampling from the 15 years old is 100% sherry, made from Methuselah, Amoroso, and Apostoles. Look at this, look at this whiskey. This is between 15 and 17 years old. What you're gonna see here is pure elegance. It's going to be still orange, but more importantly, what you're going to see is you're going to see the marmalade and the tangerine notes. Look at the tangerine notes of this lovely, beautiful, elegant whiskey. For this one, you don't need to add water. You need to just sip it and savor it and hold it. So can we do this together again? One, two, three, here we go. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And let it go down. See without the water. See the softness. Lovely marmalade, va lovely vanilla, a little bit of hit of ginger, bit of spice there. Keep it there, keep it there. And it comes together. Very soft, very elegant. See the difference? The more you keep it in your palate, First taste is important, but it's always the second taste. The second taste really extracts the flavor. Don't hesitate mm, 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 to go back to it. Hold it, hold it, hold it long in the mouth. Because I'll tell you right now, see these pussies next door in the other boat? They will knock it back. They won't care. They won't extract the flavors. That's why it's so important, and I really emphasize that to you. The longer you keep it, doesn't matter if it's wine or cognac, the longer you keep it, the more you extract the flavors. Let's go to the second whiskey. The second whiskey is the, the Grand Reserva. Yes, the Grand Reserva, and I'm very, very happy to say, have a good look at the Grand Reserva, because this is the last you'll see of it, because this used to be the cigar malt, this used to be the Dalmore Cigar Malt, and then we changed it to the Grand Reserva. We have a, what we call, anybody come across a, a department? I know it's kind of rare, but has anybody come across a department called a marketing department? Have you? Have you come across marketing? What a shower of bastards. They haven't a bloody clue. Anyway, they, they, they said, let's call it the Grand Reserva. What does the Grand Reserva mean? Uh, well, it means refined wine and everything else, but it never emphasized it. But let me just tell you, this is 60% Oloroso Sherry Butts to 40% American White Oak. 
This is the last you'll see of it because we have brought the cigar malt back. I launched it in Las Vegas just last week, but I'll tell you right now, we are calling it the Grand Reserve, uh, Cigar Grand Reserve, or no, we're not. We're calling it the Cigar Reserve Malt. That's what we're calling it, the Dalmore uh, Reserve Malt. And it contains 70%, not too far off this, but what you'll see about this is really beautiful in its own way. So let's get it right straight into the, the mouth. 60%, look at the, this lovely sherry butts that I'm gonna explain very shortly, but look at the softness. Because of the sherry, Oloroso sherry, you're gonna see the softness, the richness, and that lovely bitter chocolate coming towards the end. Hold it long in the mouth. And let it go over. Very soft, but it's got a real punch, a bit spicy to begin with, and then it opens up. So if you really want to enjoy this, take this with lovely coffee, Colombian, Nicaragua, Java coffee. Take that first, then take this whiskey, hold it long in the mouth, let it go down. Then take a chocolate, 72% cocoa fat, let that melt. That will then combine with whiskey, combine with a coffee. What do you get? A multiple orgasm. Because that's really what it's all about. These fusions, these fusions are never ever seen by many people. And if you want to extend it a little bit further, take a Hoye de Monterey Epicure number two, Partagas number four, or a Dominican Republic and smoke it. Drink, smoke, drink, and you'll see it all coming together, really compatible. Take your time with these whiskies because that's what it's all about. But please come to Dalmore, you'll see it, and let's just go right into the, the whiskey here. So what you've got here is the barley. You need the barley to make it all happen. You need, of course, the water because we've had so much snow last December. It's filled the bowels of the earth in Scotland. So we're well endowed with water. But don't think for one minute the environment is changing. Two, three years ago, now three years ago, we ran out of water at the distillery in January the 9th, you know, three years ago. So it gives you an idea of the environmental problems. Then, of course, the location. You need to have the location of the distillery. This happens to be the Paps of Jura. The Paps of Jura for our other single malt. The breast of Jura. There's three breasts here. Mountain of Gold, Mountain of Sound, and Sacred Mountain. Not many three-breasted women I've met, but uh, three-nippled. Dal, in fact, when we talked about Anne Boleyn, she was, and I don't know if you know this, she was three-nippled. Executed 19th of May 1536 by executioner, 7,000 pounds, 200 per, uh, uh, today. Uh, a lot of money, but that's one stroke of the, not an axe, it was a sword that cut her head off. But that was away back in 1536. So then we come to uh, these lovely guys, and I can I take one look at Suzanne here, and Suzanne is looking at these lovely, handsome men, and I can see she's getting really quite sexually aroused. You know? Aren't you, aren't you, Suzanne? Right, so I want you, uh, Suzanne, I want you to look at them and I want you to tell me which one do you want to sleep with tonight? <laughs> right, which, which one? <laughs> now, please, I want you to have a look at Don't just go for them. I want you to really think about it. Which one? I don't take the man with the big spade, okay? Okay, which one? <laughs> right, come on, Suzanne, which one do you want to go for? I don't know why I have to take one. I'm going to take all of them. No, no, you're going to take one of them. Take one of them. Go on. Just one. Go, go for it. Yeah, you're looking. Come on. I know, contain yourself, please. Which, which one? Which one? This one here. Well done, well done. Right, guys, have a look. Suzanne's not picked in, but which do you think is normally the most popular girls, the, the ones they go for? Any ideas? That's right, you're absolutely correct. This is a meow, pussy. What a pussy. But tell me, what are they not doing? What are the men not doing? They're not working, not drinking. You always say that. What are they not doing? Smiling. They're right, absolutely correct. They're not smiling. This was photographed in 1887. 1887, Queen Victoria was on the throne. Her beloved Prince Albert had died 14 December 1861. Life expectancy was around about 35, maybe 36 years old. As a mark of respect, nobody smiled. But what are they doing? A back-breaking job. They're cutting the peats, cut from the land, because 10% of Scotland is covered by this stuff. So I take Suzanne back to Scotland with me. Come on, Suzanne. Bonk. 
I'd kill her. And I'd take her body and I'd throw her into the peat and I'd leave her for 200 years. Then I'd come back 200 years later. Where are you, Suzanne? It's still her beautiful red hair, a lovely cherry lips. Everything is the same because no air can get in there. But what you've got to remember, 10,000 years here, 20,000 years here, we cut it through it. Goes through the fog, the yarpy and the moss. They're all damp. And when do you cut it? During the month of May, not April. It's bad luck. You want to get the juice, the oils coming up. That's when you cut it and you put it into feet. And then you put it into the kiln, set it in fire and you dry the barley. So we take the barley. There it is there. It's asleep. We give it water. What does the water do? It works like Viagra. It, it gives it life. As soon as the water touches the, 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 the barley, it starts to grow, produces the starch within the seed. Then we, of course, we have to dry it by the peat fires. Here's the peat fires here. We dry it and that impregnates it. So you have a whiskey, light, heavy, medium. That's what you decide there. Then, of course, what you do is you mash it up. You come with me. I stick your hands in it. Oh, it goes all sticky because that's what you're looking for, the sugar. You, want this, you need the sugar because you're going to cool it. You're going to then add yeast. It tacks the yeast, converts it into alcohol during the fermentation process. 48 hours later, and you stick your head in. You put, go up 20 feet up in the air because you suck in carbon dioxide. What a shower of bastards they are at the distilleries. But nevertheless, you will never forget. Then we come, of course, to the stills. What makes Scotch whiskey different? I've showed you the location, the barley, the washbacks, the fermentation. But then look at the stills, all different. When it comes to Dalmore, they're big, they're fat, they're bulbous. That's why we call them the big bastards. But look at the other shapes, small, fat, squat, and then all different, all different. Then what we do is we draw off the white spirit and we put it into the cask. This is the cask. This is what makes it happen. When you go home tonight, have a shower of a bath, how do you feel? More motivated, more stimulated, because you're all fresh, ready to take on the world yet again. <clears throat> That's what I must do with my casks, with my clothes. And where do I go? Here in America, to the Ozark Mountain Range of Missouri, 40,000 square miles of natural forest, two barrels per tree. And when I think of American white oak, Quercus Alba, I think of a beautiful woman. Because that beautiful woman from American white oak will seduce my whiskey, give me light elegant qualities, but it's not enough for me. I go to Spain, 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 and I go and get my sherry, S-H-E-R-R-Y. Richard, why are you shouting at me? Because when I go to America, when I go to Europe, I say sherry. And then they say to me, I never knew cherries were made in whiskey. I never mentioned cherries. Yes, you did, you said cherries. No, I didn't, I said sherry. Fino, a Montelado, a Manzanilla, but more importantly, Oloroso. When you go to the bodegas of Spain, some of you must go to the bodegas of Spain, Gonzalez Baez, established in 1835. When you walk into the bodegas, the smell of the wine hits you and you sense differences going on. What we do for the Dalmore is that we take Methuselah and we take at least 30 old Methuselah. And what happens? I take the cask and I put five liters in the cask. It's then brought to Scotland. By the time it gets to Scotland, it's only three liters. You have to take the sherry out. You're not allowed to add the sherry to it. But the inside, the pores are different. They're soaked. And when I put my 10 year old Dalmore, for three years, it sucks and takes that sherry from the pores of the wood. That's what I'm looking for. That's why I have to really tailor it according to great clothes that come from the Oloroso. So we fire from the American white oak. We put it into the warehouse. It begins its long sleep. 5% is lost the first year, 2% the next year. It's all part of the evaporation process to mature the whiskey. 
80 million liters of rain go up. And as you can see from the walls here, they're black. That's what happens to the fumes of the whiskey. You can see it, the warehouses there, they turn black. They go out into the atmosphere. The trees out there, they are black as well. No, they're not, Richard, they are. So when you come to the warehouse, don't just walk in. I want you to once again, smell it. Once you smell, oh, this is a damp warehouse. Oh, this is a good warehouse. This is only three high, but who runs the company? Bloody accountants. So they then, let's look at this. And we're still look at this. What a shower of bastards. And you know, just give you an example. I, you know, this is pallet stowing. You get the faultless trough, ooh. They go in like this, ooh, and, this, and they take the cask out for you. So I said to them about, I don't know, eight weeks ago, I said, get me some 1975s. And they said, but Richard, there's 5,000 casks blocking the aisles to get your cask. You better get on with it because you put them in like that. I'm looking for my 1975 casks. And that's what happened. So be aware of the production. Then when it comes to Scotland, hands up who's not been to Scotland. You bastards, you, you come to Scotland, right? <laughs> now this is, what do you got? Suzanne, have you been? No, you've not been. Suzanne, pay attention because this is Scotland. 20,000 years ago it was covered in ice. It was known as the Great Eurasian Glacier. In some places it was one mile thick and then it melted, melted, melted and gorged out the land. The Romans came and we called it Scotty because we're a bunch of bandits and that's how you get the name Scotland. But Suzanne, this is for you. Scotland is 276 miles long by 147 miles wide, has a coastline of 5,006.6 nautical miles, 721 islands, 161 of them, about 100 acres, and they've got sheep on them. And after 10 days, their sheep are dog goddamn beautiful. Anyway, mention that. But we've also got about 5.6 million people, 156,000 lo lone mothers. We've got 376 railway stations, but never mind. What you've got to remember is at the present moment, we've got 100, 106 distilleries operating in Scotland. Like all of you here tonight, each one of you is different in your own way. And it's the same with the distilleries. My job as master blenders is to identify these distilleries and see how they mature over the years. What we do is we draw an imaginary line between Greenock up to D, the whiskies below that line are known as lowland malts. Because the land is fairly flat, light and body, charm, elegance, femininity. But if you want muscle, structure, come up to the Highland region. Go beyond Inverness, Dalmore's the way up here, Speyside Valley, 44 distilleries are there. Elegant, refined. That's the Highland region. Then you come down to Campbellton. Used to be three distilleries there. There's only three. And then over to Isla, medicinal, smoky, peppery. The grain whiskies are mainly sent between Glasgow and Edinburgh, although it's Invergordon up there. So we take the whiskies, we put them into the uh, sample room, here's my sample room here, we put them into the vat, we vat them together. Same with the single malts. We bring them together, put them in there, and we put them finally into these in situ sherry butts. So when you look at the next whiskey, the 18 years old, this lovely, where's the 18? I've got it here. There we go, 18, this is a baby. Just one for the second year running, the best bl uh, single malt whiskey in San Francisco, double gold medal winner. Really outstanding in every way. But what you see about this is body, character. First thing you're gonna see about this is marmalade. Marmalade, taken from Mary Queen of Scots. You know how the name marmalade came about? You know that, don't you? Yes, you do. Mary Queen of Scots. She married the Dauphin of France in 1561, and he unfortunately died, so he, she had to come back and reclaim her throne. So she set off in the first galleon, 915, 19th of August, 1561. She wasn't known as Mary over there in France, she was known as Mary. So during the voyage, she was seasick. She was Mary Malad. And that's how you get the name Marmalade. Did you know that? You bunch of ignorant sods, you know. 
And did you know that when she was finally executed on the 8th of February, 1587, when the executioner brought the ax down, he hit the back of her neck, blood spurted up, and then hit her again, didn't quite sever the head, more blood. And then the third stroke finally got her head off, all the blood over the place, and that's how you get the cocktail of Bloody Mary. Now you know it. So there we have. So when you take this 18 years old, this is between 18 to 21 years old. I want you to hold it long, long, long in the mouth. Have we, have we got that 18 years old? Here we go. One, two, three. Down we go. Very different, very spicy, and very different. See the body, the character of it, but it's even more accentuated in the last, the last whiskey. Have we got King Alexander here? No? Where's the King Alexander? Oh yeah, here we are. King Alexander, the last whiskey. I'm obviously aware of the time here, but this is something very, very special. This is the King Alexander, the last whiskey you're gonna sample here tonight. And this, in fact, is the only single malt in the world with six different finishes. This is Port, Madeira, Masala, Cabernet Sauvignon, small batch bourbon. So when you see this whiskey, you're gonna see a whole, whole, whole multitude of beautiful flavors. Look at it. Take your time. I really want you to, I know we haven't got too much time, but I really do want you to take that last whiskey away with you. Sip it, savor it, really get into it. Unfortunately, I was, um, I was in uh, Los, uh, Las Vegas <coughs> and uh, somebody gave me a very generous glass of the King Alexander. The barman said to me, there you are, Mr. Patterson, here's your King Alexander. I said, oh, I'm really looking so much forward to this. It's been a very heavy night. I've had a quite a number of presentations. I now want to relax, sit down and sip and savor it. And just as I put my hand out, his hand disappeared. And suddenly this happened. And he didn't stop there. He just kept going on and on and on and on. He wasn't happy. He wanted to just give me more and more. And he said, there you are, sir. I've given you a scotch on the rocks. I said, excuse me. I didn't ask for my whiskey, a scotch on the rocks. But we're in Las Vegas. This is a warm, warm place. You need to have some ice in your whiskey. You need to have it in the rocks. And I said, I can't even get into the whiskey. He <laughs> said, what you've got to remember, in the olden days, when there was no ice, the Scots went to the riverbeds, they took the rocks that had been chilled by the mountain snows, and they put that into the whiskey. That's how you get scotch on the rocks. But all I'm going to say to you, if you are in a bar and somebody does give you ice, what do you do with it? You chuck it away. Oh, oh sorry, that's your equipment there. Oh, I beg your pardon. I, I, I beg your pardon. I, I'm so sorry. Anyway, uh, I think it's all right. Uh, okay, so, so before, before I go, I, I know that you're, you, you're, you love single malt whiskey, but which one of you really does like single malt? Is there somebody here that likes single malt? Yes. Lover, lover. All right, what's that? That's, I saw your hand going up, this one here. What's your name? John. John. Come on, John. It's your lucky night, John. Let me just, get, let me just go over here very quickly. Uh, I've got Dawn. She's biting at me. I can tell. And, and you know, this is it. Let me, let me just give you a whiskey. John, come on around. I'm going to abuse you for a minute. Right. Just, just, I'm going to move you around that here. Just, just come up here. Right. Does everybody know John? Hi, John. Hi, you say a big warm to John. Let me just make sure we've got